Hi, a while back we designed these LED strips which I've now installed in the bathroom, some really nice ambient illumination. But there's quite a lot of these strips and these strips are capable of quite high powers. Overall, there's over 200 watts of LED lighting. So obviously we wanna be able to dim these LED lights up and down. So what I want to do today is work out how we're gonna drive these LEDs and actually go through the design process through to making a PCB. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about MOSFETs, about gate drivers, and about some of the PCB design. And I wanna get it into this kind of form factor so that I can mount this onto my smart LED driver and it be compatible with all the other software that I've got on there. So as I mentioned, these little LED strips draw about 150 milliamps each. So in total, uh, this is actually about nine amps. And that works fine if we're driving these LEDs at full current. The power supply is capable of delivering about 240 watts. But once we start chopping up the waveform, that's quite a pulsatile waveform. Incidentally, I'm aiming for a PWM frequency of between 250 and 1000 hertz. We tested that with these little constant current chips in a previous video, and that sort of range seemed to work quite nicely. But little pulses of nine amps at 250 hertz is potentially gonna be quite noisy and also quite harsh on the power supply. So one thing that I'm thinking of doing is splitting this up into three. So uh, actually having three individual drivers rated for three amps each, and actually have them offset in terms of phase. So what I'm talking about is perhaps instead of uh, this waveform here, which represents probably around a 20% duty cycle for all of these LEDs, one big pulse of nine amps and then nothing, and then another big pulse of nine amps, we split the LEDs up into three, three separate drivers and phase shift the PWM waveform by 120 degrees so that we get much more even coverage over time from the power supply. And therefore the overall pulses are only three amps here and it also should reduce the constraints on the MOSFETs that we choose to drive these LEDs. So this is one of the PCBs that plugs into my LED controller board, and this is what we need to fit our LED drivers on. So some of this is on every board, a couple of resistors to tell the main board what PCB is connected, but basically we've got from the start of this relay all the way to the end for our electronics for this LED driver. Um, now we need to start somewhere with our parts selection. So some of the parameters that we'll be looking at for our MOSFETs are the maximum drain current, which we know needs to be at least three amps now that we're dividing this by three. We need to think about our on resistance for the MOSFET because that basically dictates how much power dissipation we're gonna have in that MOSFET. We also need to pick, it has a suitable voltage rating and we also need to be looking at the gate capacitance because that basically decides whether or not we need those gate drivers. Now, we can easily fit three TO220 packages on here. That would have quite a high power dissipation per package without any heat sink. We'd easily dissipate about three quarters of a watt, possibly one watt. Uh, we could also fit some S08 surface mount packages on this board as well, but the power dissipation in those is gonna be a little bit lower. But let's write some numbers down and have a look to try and work out how we're gonna find some suitable parts for this design. So I've just jotted down a few numbers. Now our TO220 through hole package can easily handle 750 milliwatts. We know that it would be uh, about three amps per channel. So we can plug some numbers into our power equation here and it tells us the resistance 83 milliohms that's the maximum resistance of our MOSFET when turned fully on that we want to keep the power dissipation below 750 milliwatts. Now, it's slightly more complicated than that, but that's a starting point, and we'll talk about some of the complications in a moment. Uh, but if we went with an SO8 package, uh, we do need to have a think about the thermals here. Um, so if we look in the data sheet, it typically says most of the uh, junction to ambient temperature rise is gonna be around 55 kelvins per watt. Now there are power packages with a big uh, pad on the bottom that you can solder onto your PCB. This is for a standard SO8 package and at 750 milliwatts that means that we would see a temperature rise of 42 degrees C which is probably fine for this application as well. So we could look at an SO8 package. We need to also look at the specifications for the maximum VDS which is our voltage between drain and source. In terms of just erring on the side of caution, it's always sensible to try and double that, uh, especially when we've got long leads between the MOSFET 
and the load we can get all kinds of transients going on and that kind of thing so it makes sense just to double that if this proves to be a problem then we can obviously look at folding that back to something a bit closer to our supply voltage uh, and then the other thing is we need to look at the maximum on current it needs to be greater than three amps probably more like five amps but what we'll find is as we get higher in terms of the current carrying capability of the MOSFET the gate capacitance start to increase and that also has some undesirable effects on the power dissipation and on the gate drive circuitry. But let's have a quick look at DigiKey and see if these are feasible numbers for our MOSFET. So here we are on the DigiKey website we'll go to semiconductors and then down to MOSFETs, single MOSFETs and we need them in stock end channel uh, we'll pick our drain source voltage so let's go between 50 and 60 volts and we want to pick our continuous drain current for some reason they haven't got a minimum to maximum here so we're going to have to individually select them but we'll go from about 4.7 amps here upwards to about 6 amps so we've got our 36 results and we've got a whole variety of different types of packages. Uh, we've got some SO8 packages there, our TO220. Let's have a look at the on resistance here. So we'll sort by on resistance. Ideally we want this as low as possible but what we'll often find is the gate charge is a little bit higher for these. So you can see here 34 nanocoulombs up here. As we go down this list we might see that falling but there's still some anomalies at this point here we've got one there with extremely low uh, gate charge which means we could very easily drive that directly um, with a microcontroller pin or something like that but it looks like most of these would do the job so we can probably go based on package type and cost more than anything else so i don't really want to be spending too much here there's some of these that are one pound 52 that's already four pounds 50 in parts just for the three MOSFETs on one of these boards. So let's put a limit on the price. So we're sorting by price now. We've got a few cheap options here, which I think is what we're going to aim for more than anything else. So uh, we've got one in a SOP223 package here, 25 pence each. That seems like quite decent. Uh, we just go across and we can see that has a RDS on of 33 milliohm. So well within spec here. We've got a couple of high ones here that won't be suitable. Um, we've got this one underneath that would also work. That's in a little SOT 23. So let's have a look at these two and see what the specs look like. So this one's going to ship from Rochester Electronics. That's fine. I don't mind the slight extra delay. So continuous drain current 5.2 amps. Pulse drain current all the way up to 21. Uh, VGS 20 volts that's fine that's our maximum gate drive voltage. So some of these graphs are quite important in the data sheet and the one on the right here is the drain source on resistance. So if we were to drive the gate directly with our 3.3 volts from our microcontroller we'd be looking at this graph at the top so D it's about 3.4 volts here but we'd see the on resistance uh, they've incorrectly labeled this ohms it's milliohms uh, we'd see it over 80 milliohms here going up to nearly 100 milliohms so that's not going to be any good for this application but as we increase the drive voltage we go all the way down to this one here which is at 10 volts and that's where we get our consistent sort of 22 milliohms on resistance so that does imply we need some kind of level shifting or some kind of gate drive to be able to get the best out of this MOSFET. The other thing to take a look at here is the gate charge. Now this does uh, vary with the amount of current that we're driving but with VGS at about 10 volts we're going to be needed it's going to be charging about 30 nanocoulombs into the gate which is an important parameter which we'll talk about shortly. Then we have this little SOT23 part and if we look at the data sheet here what I'm interested in first of all are the thermal characteristics of this device. So uh, somewhere along here yeah, it should say junction to ambient 130 degrees C per watt. So that's double what we looked at for the SO8 package. So we saw 42 degrees C rise there. Now we'd be looking at 84 degrees C rise if the on resistance is 83 milliohms. 
So now we need to have a look to see what the on resistance looks like. So again, we're looking at the graphs here. And we've got RDS on is about 35. So at 10 volts, going a little bit higher at 4.5 volts. So this one actually looks like it would also do the job. But at uh, around 4 amps there, we can do a quick calculation. So that 35 milliohms would give us a power dissipation of about 315 milliwatts. And then if we go back to the start of the data sheet where it had that figure, um, so our temperature rise would be 315 milliwatts times 130 which is a temperature rise of about 40 degrees C. So uh, we'd probably be looking at about uh, 71 degrees C case temperature, which is a little bit high, but could also work. So this is an option. However, I'm inclined to go towards something that's going to handle the power a little bit easier in terms of the thermals. So I think we're going to look at using this SOT223 device here. Now there's a really useful app note from Texas Instruments, it's SLUA618A and if you search that in Google uh, it will come up with this Texas Instruments app note. And if we scroll down to here these are some important diagrams. So these are some examples of equivalent diagrams for our MOSFET. And I mentioned before about the gate charge. Now that's a result of these two capacitances here. And the gate charge depends on how much current is flowing from drain to source as well as the voltage on the gate. So they gave that example 30 nanocoulombs with a gate drive voltage of 10 volts and 5 amps flowing from drain source. So that's great, but what does that mean? Well, basically, our gate driver has to be able to charge these two capacitors. And if we've got an impedance charging a capacitor, we're going to see an amount of time for the voltage on that capacitor to rise up. And if we go back to the data sheet on the MOSFET, at low uh, gate voltages, we saw the highest resistance um, RDS on. And as it increased all the way up to 10 volts, that's where we saw our headline figure of about 22 milliohms. Now, the problem with this is if we take too long charging that capacitor, we're actually going to have a very high power dissipation in that MOSFET because it's going to take a long time for it to get from uh, all the way up here, 100 ohm, milliohms, all the way down to 22 milliohms. So you'll find that if you don't use any kind of logic when you're designing your gate drive circuitry, your MOSFET will get quite a lot hotter than you anticipate, and it's quite easy to blow them up um, because it doesn't take long for the actual uh, semiconductor inside to heat up and uh, die. So what we want to do is we want to be able to drive the gate with as much current as possible so we spend a very low amount of time in that region where it's not all the way up to 10 volts at our gate voltage. So how do we do that? So back to our calculations. In the data sheet, it said 30 nanocoulombs gate charge to turn on that MOSFET at our parameters here. So if we were able to deliver one amp into the gate, it would only take 30 nanoseconds to turn that MOSFET on. If that got reduced for whatever reason, based on the output of some microcontroller or something like that down to one milliamp, then it would take 30 microseconds. Now, on their own, these numbers don't mean a great deal, but when we're switching at a certain frequency, so we're going to be turning these LEDs potentially on and off at up to one kilohertz, that means we're going to see one cycle every one milliseconds, and then these numbers become quite relevant. So this slower number is actually 3% of the time where the LEDs would be on uh, would be spent switching the transistor on and off so we wouldn't be reaching that 22 milliohms of on resistance and in fact it's worse than that because we we have to not only deliver the charge but we have to be able to remove it to be able to turn the MOSFET off so we're actually up to six percent here when we're talking about one amp then we're talking about much much lower numbers and when we increase in frequency this becomes a much bigger problem so when we're designing switch mode controllers that might be operating at hundreds of kilohertz or even megahertz these numbers are extremely relevant and that's where gate drivers are very important and that's where you really need to be a lot more aware of the parameters that you're picking for your MOSFET. But it looks like uh, just based on these figures here we want to be able to uh, drive the gate probably between about 100 milliamps and 1 amp and then that leaves us with a figure here uh, with a bit of headroom um, because the on resistance I think was only 22 uh, milliohms 
that means that with these percentages here, uh, overall dissipation is still going to be well below the limits that we set out before. So I think we're going to aim for um, a gate drive current of between 100 milliamps and 1 amp. Now, in some instances, we might be able to get away with a high output drive logic gate or even the output from our microcontroller. But in this instance, we want that gate drive voltage to be up at 10 volts. Now, there's various ways that we can deliver that gate drive voltage. Uh, we could come up with some kind of discrete solution like we've got here with a couple of transistors. And that might be a fairly cheap option. But we will have a quick look on DigiKey at dedicated gate drivers and see where they come in terms of price before we decide on the best solution. So we need to look for power management, PMIC. Then we can go to gate drivers. And they've got a couple of uh, different configurations here. So we can have multiple outputs. However, I think most of the higher number of drivers are for brushless DC motor drives. They're full bridge. And um, we actually only want half bridge driver. Uh, we're not bothered about having drive for two sets of transistors on here. So we want in stock, obviously. And let's have a look at what options we've got. Not many left, only 11. We'll sort by price. And there's a couple here from Microchip. In fact, that looks pretty good. Quite expensive, though. So let's have a look at the data sheet for it. So 1.5 amp MOSFET driver, so that would definitely give us a very fast switching time. Wide input supply, voltage range 4.5 to 18 volts. Now, uh, I do actually have 12 volts available on the riser board, so I think we'll drive the gate with that 12 volt supply. We should be able to feed it directly into this. And this is what the internal block diagram looks like. So we've got this totem pole driver here. Uh, and we just got an enable and an input. So pretty straightforward device, but it's a little bit on the pricey side. So I'm just going to have a quick look at some of the other providers, maybe from Mauser, and just see if they've got anything else. So this one has popped up on Mauser, quite an interesting one, a lot cheaper. Uh, 31 pence if we buy 10 of them, so that's much more acceptable. In a little SOT23 package, so a better form factor as well. So let's have a look at the data sheet and see if there's anything in there. Um, so it's a 1 amp gate driver up to 40 volts. Um, SOT23 6 pin package. Now interestingly you can see the two outputs are independent. Presumably you can link them together. Uh, they've also shown it here with a resistor and a diode to control the turn on and turn off times. But we probably just want it as quick as possible so we can just tie them together. Um, so yeah that one looks like it might do the job quite nicely. Uh, switching times, again, we don't need to worry too much. Uh, we're talking about a one millisecond period max, so uh, this should be absolutely fine. And it turns out that part is actually available from DigiKey. For some reason, it didn't come up in my search before, but here it is, um, slightly more expensive, 33 pence each, uh, but that makes it a bit easier. I only have to order from one place. Uh, one thing to note, SOT26, that confused me for a moment. Uh, I've not come across that term before, but it's another way of describing a 6-pin SOT23 package. So uh, something to be aware of there. But this looks like the ideal part to use in this design. So here we are in Proteus, and I've actually just modified an existing design. So I just added the new MOSFETs to this design and added the gate drivers, but a lot of it is carried over from a previous design. Uh, you can see here are the new MOSFETs, and I've added some diodes up here just to protect the circuit in case we get any back EMF. We're driving LEDs on a reasonable length of cable. That cable might have a bit of inductance, and when we're switching on and off, we don't want any damage to our board. So we've got some diodes up here, MOSFETs down here, and then you can just see here we've got the MOSFET drivers, so that ZXGD 3009s, and... These are powered from the 12 volt supply that's already present on the PCB. I've just put a couple of ceramic capacitors next to each of the supply pins because these do need a very low impedance supply. Otherwise, you end up with the same problem where you're taking forever to charge up the gate. So we've got these capacitors here. Uh, the other stuff on the board is generic to these PCBs. So there's a couple of resistors which tell the main board which module is plugged in. 
we've got the 10 pin header that goes off to the main motherboard and then at the top here we've just got some status LEDs so we've got three LEDs which reflect what each of these three channels is doing as well as a general power LED so that's it for the schematic very straightforward so let's go on to the PCB layout right so I think I've got all of the components where I want them because I copied the general project over into this new design it's meant that I haven't had to redraw the PCB layout or get the 10 pin header or the M3 mounting screw uh, in place these are all copied over from the existing design so I've only had to quickly lay out this part in the center I think everything's where I need it uh, probably might put a couple of labels in just to show uh, you know this is channel 1 channel 2 and channel 3 um, there's some LEDs associated with each channel here and I think when I do the routing, I may also add a copper pad here just to make sure we've got enough thermal dissipation from the SOP223 MOSFETs. But it's pretty straightforward. I've got a ground plane on the top and the bottom, and that should be sufficient. Um, I'll do one thick trace from the 12 volt pin up here down to uh, near where these MOSFET drivers are but those are the only areas where we're going to be carrying any kind of significant current. Over here, we just need some thick traces from the ground pad to the MOSFETs and then a thick trace from each of the MOSFETs back to the terminal block here. And I think that's it. So what I've ended up doing is adding some zones to each of these sections. So basically, this is a small copper pore for each of the channels to make sure we've got a good low impedance path from the MOSFET through to the terminal block. And then you can see we've got the ground plane going all the way along. That's the bottom copper. The top one's broken up slightly because in this section at the top here, we've got the 12 volt supply, which is the feed to the gate drivers. All of the other sections here are the ground plane. And there's a few stitching wires all over the place. Now, uh, let's have a look at PCB way because that does affect what size wires that we might want to choose because um, some of the technologies affect the price when we order the PCB. So uh, first of all, let's quickly create the Gerber files and then we'll upload them to the PCBWay website, have a look at which options it's selected and then have a look what will happen if we change some of those settings. So when you're designing a PCB, it's well worth going to the website of whoever you're planning to get the PCB ultimately made by. First of all, to have a look at the design rules and PCBWay have got loads of design rules on their website, but also there are a few things that might change the price on your PCB. So um, if you start plugging in numbers before you get too far in the design, it can help you from suddenly having an unexpected cost in the design. So the basic PCB, 80 by 30 millimeters, and I want 10 of them made. Uh, the price for that is $5, and then there's a shipping fee, uh, although I'm not based in the US, so we can ignore that for now. Um, now, this is the, the default numbers, and in the design so far, I've made sure not to use any holes smaller than 0.3 millimeters. In fact, I think all the wires I've used 0.35 millimeters. If I had, without even thinking about it, used 0.25 millimeter wires, then the price here you can see remains the same. Drop it down to 0.2, and then all of a sudden it's jumped up to about $80. And in the past, I have accidentally done this. So uh, particularly with components that have had thermal wires underneath them, the library parts had 0.2 millimeter wires under there, and it suddenly caused the price to escalate rapidly. So uh, it's well worth checking these things. Again, the track spacing, if you're using high density components where the pins are very close together, this can have a big effect on the price as well, as you can see, uh, up to $143. So what we'll do now is we'll just upload the Gerber files that I just created and we'll have a look at what options we're going to pick. So we've got the Gerbers and we should be able to upload those. Two layer board, 80 by 30 millimetres and we've got a rough outline here which shows what it should look like. So uh, that all looks correct. Again, 80 by 30 millimetres, so that's the same. I want 10 of these PCBs, so we've updated that. Um, green PCB I think is fine for this um, however I quite like the immersion gold as usual we have a look at that suddenly the price has just gone up a little bit uh, certainly not bad $45 for the boards plus the shipping cost once again um, the wires the tenting wires is absolutely fine copper thickness again uh, not a problem in this design but if we did want the two ounce copper that would increase the cost just a little bit more $62 
And one thing that I like to do is also remove the ID because when these boards are panelized, they have a little ID number. Uh, I'd rather remove that and I think it's $1.50 extra. And then we'll do the SMD stencil as well. Since this is all uh, or pretty much all surface mount parts, it makes sense to get the stencil made. And uh, we want the stencil on the top side. Thickness 0 0.12 is fine. We haven't got any particularly uh, high density components. And one thing that you can do um, is to put in the custom size of the stencil. At the moment, you'd get shipped a 190 by 290 millimeter stencil. That might be too big for what you're doing. So sometimes what I'll do, uh, and in fact, I think I'll do it in this case, is it's 80 by 30. So I think we'll allow a centimeter overlap on each side. So we'll do 100 by 50 millimeters. And simply, um, I've just typed this in the past, please make stencil 100 millimeters by 50 millimeters. And they'll cut it to size. That just means it's a little bit easier to handle on your bench. And that's it. So we can pick uh, the United Kingdom. Oops, it was up top there. And if you choose the DDP option, then there's no possibility of getting uh, any import charges or anything like that. Um, so this one's a little bit more expensive, $43. We could pick PCB Way Express. I've used that before and it arrived pretty quickly. So I think that's what we're going to go with today. And as soon as these PCBs arrive, then uh, I'll upload the next part of the video where we reassemble the boards and we'll see how long it actually takes. First of all, for the boards to arrive, have a look at the quality and then we'll start assembling. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.